My name's Dice, and I survived Munchausen by proxy. So I really, really wanted to talk publicly about surviving Munchausen by proxy. Um, it's in the DSM now as factitious disorder imposed on another, which is a mouthful. Um, either name, I don't like. They're not good representatives. Yeah. Um, but it's been like pretty big in news like in the past five years or something i feel like movies too like movies definitely yeah. have kind of shed some light on it for sure yeah um but i feel like when the act came out on hulu about dd Dee Dee blanchard and gypsy rose blanchard yes. in that case that got so public yeah that's when it was like pushed into the mainstream right because it's been a concept for a while. I mean, Baron von Munchausen was like 18th century or something. So I don't know when he became a disease. I found that the the um, Gypsy Rose story that like I was so fascinated by that. Yeah. That was something because I just feel like even though obviously it's very real and it happens mm -hmm. to watch on both ends, like someone that is doing that to someone else, but also somebody that's kind of like brainwashing away and doesn't even really know what's it's so intriguing to me there is absolutely a huge factor of brainwashing yeah i mean how else are you gonna go get somebody to like accept being put under a knife right other than like convincing them that they're supposed to be right or drugging them that happens yeah. a lot but right. also like social media and i found this out with like watching true crime cases mm -hmm. has um i think really made it more prevalent because it's added this financial motivation where people set up GoFundMes because the most successful GoFundMes are usually like severely ill children. Like yeah. just the um, fundraising for care like that. I mean, it's very expensive in reality. And Dee Dee Blanchard definitely had that going on there was another one i think her name is kelly turner mm -hmm. and her daughter passed away unfortunately and there was a huge financial motivation that was probably her primary thing yeah um and gypsy ended up murdering her mom right gypsy arranged for the murder okay. of her mom with it, the boyfriend right From yes what I remember? okay that's what I thought. so the boyfriend definitely deserves a larger sentence in yeah. my opinion he didn't he was not fighting for his right. life but um there are so many parallels between uh miss blanchard and my eldest sibling so my mom died when i was 10 and my brothers are older than me by six and nine years and my eldest sibling, the first target, you know, definitely set off mom's uh, maternal drives. Because there's definitely a maternal, you know, caregiving aspect. And you right. want to be a good one of whatever that means to you when you have that. Um, but my brother, so he was the first target. And being the eldest, he had more time to experience my mom's behaviors. But also, my mom had a lot of things going on in addition to the Munchausen by proxy. She had substance abuse problems, big time. And she also had Munchausen syndrome imposed on herself, big time. And by that, you mean like one of her parents had it? No. Or well, I mean, so I recently learned that her mom had like on the spectrum of Munchausen by proxy ranging from like the super subtle just taking too much uh Control. fulfillment okay. out of whatever does happen to the child to like those cases you sometimes hear about where the parent, and I am only going to talk about the parent-child ones. Got it. There are plenty of cases where it's a spousal thing or uh, elderly care. Um, a lot of those end in death as well. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but so like the far end of the spectrum, I'd say, are those mothers who will dehydrate their child and inject them with a huge ton of sodium, like really direct action. To like make them sick. Basically. Yes. Okay. Um, and there are a few true <laughs> cases like that, as well as like that's what I learned when I was in school for psychology were cases like that before it got mainstream. And I might be jumping ahead a little bit, which if Go I ahead. am, we can like hit on it later. I have notes for that. Okay, good. But basically like in certain cases, I guess, if the parent is like trying to make the child sick, wouldn't you say it's in a sense of like, well, one control, but two to like, so that the child basically needs them and like can't leave their care? a paragraph Okay, good. that. I, good. Can, I can go ahead and explain Whatever you that want. One. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but um, my grandmother had like the early end of the spectrum okay. there and it wasn't in that, like my, my mom has siblings and she wasn't the target of that flavor of Munchausen's, um, but she was exposed to it. So um, that's sort of how it went for her. But uh, when I said that she had Munchausen's uh, imposed her on herself, you know, regular Munchausen syndrome or factitious disorder in the DSM. Um, she made herself sick for the attention. Got it. She, so a lot of these like mainstream cases that you hear about and a lot of what I think the general population who are aware of it associate with it is that somebody ends up being killed. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of wanted to, you know, for me, I'm a survivor of that abuse. I made it out alive, um, but I still couldn't get away from this theme of death because my mom's Munchausen killed her. Fortunately, there was no murder involved, no suicide exactly. But yeah, it's still pretty, pretty um, extreme. She also had borderline personality disorder. I don't know if she was, like, diagnosed with it during her lifetime. I know that she saw therapists and always thought that they were wrong about everything. So I don't know in those sessions whether she was diagnosed with anything officially. But, you know, I I learned about it in school. And she is a textbook case. Mm -hmm. I don't remember when Marsha Lenahan published the dialectical behavioral therapy works that she did you know the it's like the seminal treatment for borderline personality disorder it's also used for like eating disorders and uh, just now it's shifting into just every you know use of therapy but she was a person who had bpd herself and she worked really hard and got her phd and did all of this work to find a way for people with that to go from being like villainous people because it's characterized by a lot of disordered relationships and extreme behaviors um extreme emotions to learning tools and developing healthy relationships before her it was just like nobody wanted to take on those patients And I do think that my mom probably fell in the before times. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, with mental illness, having these conditions doesn't make you engage in these behaviors. That's a choice. Having the trauma that she did didn't make her do anything. Behavior is always a choice. You can think whatever you want. You can feel whatever happens to you i won't say whatever you want because it sucks to feel bad um but the the choice is there and one of the things that really pisses me off about my mom is that she was so intelligent she was so good like she was charismatic she had insight into like the human experience Except as it applied to her. Mm-hmm. Um, but she had the the tools to be better. She knew how to be better. With my dad, he's still around. He was like the opposite of my mom in Were so they many together? ways. 
Um, they had divorced by the time she died. Mm-hmm. I'll get into that craziness, but um, okay. I I kind of say that marrying her was the best thing and the worst thing that happened to him. The best because I don't think he would have found anybody who would have given him a family the way that she did. Mm -hmm. But the reason that she probably glommed on to him was that he was easily manipulated. So with my dad, I feel like a lot of his failings as a parent, not all of them, but during my upbringing and the better version of my dad post-mom, was he just didn't have the ability mentally to do better. Whereas my mom absolutely did and chose not to. So let me ask you, Mm -hmm. and I would assume this is like more opinion based, Mm -hmm. but, and pronounce it for me again. Which one? Munchausen? Munchausen by proxy, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's considered a mental illness, correct or incorrect? It is in the DSM. It's diagnosable, so it's a mental illness. However, some psychologists have put it out there that it's not. It's just a form of abuse. Okay, got it. Because that was kind of going to be my question of like, if it is a mental illness, like even though, because there's a lot of people with mental illness that can have intelligence and like Mm -hmm. all these other categories and then can't really control the other things that they do. And I almost feel like, like a narcissist, like they make choices to be the way that they are. But at the same time, if that's just how someone is, I feel like, how do you really train someone out of that? Like, if that's just who they are. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of where, like... Personality disorders, including BPD, are still very controversial. Okay. Because you're, like, you're making a person, like, their whole personality, who Mm -hmm. they are, into a disease. Got it. So you view the way that she treated you guys as more of a a form of abuse and a mental illness i or kind of like no i actually feel some of it was straight up abuse okay um when it comes to the munchausen stuff and like just weird shit that happened Mm -hmm. i feel that she put her emotional needs before her children okay and She had had that done to her, and she told me a lot about it. She was very abused as a child. Okay. And, you know, all throughout her relationship with her parents. Um, But, so she knew better. She claimed to want to do better, but she still did it. Okay, makes sense. And it's, it's hard to get in that mindset of, like, a lot of these Munchausen's people, they want to not just be seen as a caregiver and a good one um but like there's there's a seed in there motivating towards that expression Mm -hmm. of their emotional needs um there like there are so many ways to fulfill disordered emotional needs like could have been uh, with violence it could have been with running away from us it there were so many other ways but that's the route that she took okay and with a lot of it I don't know like with the medical stuff especially mm-hmm. I don't know how much was conscious or deliberate yeah. okay and how much was like her other stuff going on in her head channeling into this expression okay um because there were there was so much going on and like if you're a hypochondriac and a mom how's that different than being than having lunch house right yeah you know a lot of like new moms will take their kids to the hospital and doctors constantly it's not that they're making their kids sick it's that they're afraid their kids are sick and if you add that to thinking that you're smarter than doctors then you start getting into trouble and my mom was incredibly intelligent she didn't do anything with it even though she could have but I'd say maybe like an IQ in the 150s is what I I've heard and you said it it was your older siblings that kind of really got the most of it um 
My eldest sibling got the most of it. Okay. Um, and that was your brother? Uh, they're both brothers. Okay. Um, and I don't want to go too much into their stories, okay. except like as I experienced right. them. But my eldest brother, I have memories of him being completely deaf and wheelchair bound. He didn't go to school for many years and uh, whether he was homeschooled or had dropped out completely, eventually he got his GED as an adult, but he wasn't going to school. He wasn't building a social life because he was in hospitals, in the wheelchair, incoherent, um, like scarily a lot like uh, Miss Gypsy Rose was. Um, And that was all... Due to your mom? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, he also, like, I have memories of spending the holidays in the hospital after he'd had surgeries. Um, and were these, like, necessary surgeries or no? So, like, in cases like that, it's like, how are they getting the doctors to do these surgeries? Or, like, or was your mom actually making him kind of, like, sick to need them? Um, probably a bit of both. She okay. definitely fed all three of us drugs. Um, and that gets into like an element of control. You know, if your kid's sedated, you can control them. Um, but I, I definitely remember like reading some of these medication bottles. I thought like one of them had a pretty name. So like it's stuck in my head. And when I looked it up as an adult, it's like, what could she have given me this for? And I looked into it a little more and I'm pretty sure it was to induce some sort of symptom. We also lived in severe squalor and um, way below the poverty line. So there were nutritional deficits. There were environmental things that um, made us prone to colds and infections and, you know, (laughs) nutritional deficits that people don't generally look for. You know, we ate a lot of like pasta and plain Rice Krispie cereal and skim milk and not a lot of fresh foods. And that's because that's what gets donated. But there are a lot of elements that contributed to us being genuinely ill and manufactured to be ill. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the comments that I've seen on videos about these real life cases have been like, I don't understand how these medical professionals could possibly do this to a child they don't have any evidence for the mom is like pushing for it like surgeries and stuff Mm -hmm. okay but to that i say you need a lot of understanding of how medical science works um so like you know we've had as human history we've had surgeries and medications since paleolithic times um and some of them have been accurate like people i don't know eight thousand years ago were chewing willow bark for pain relief and that's where we get aspirin from from um so like a lot of it's been legit but it's like the scientific method You know, this rigorous testing and evidence-based thing not rooted in spirituality so much is very new. It's like 18th century new um, and really beefed up during the Industrial Revolution when we had the technology to like, for Louis Pasteur to see penicillin. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, compare that to 10,000 years of written history It's medicines in its infancy. It's as much an art as a science. And I currently live with a few chronic illnesses, which dealing with that after surviving Munchausen by proxy, oh my God. It's like, do I have Munchausen's? Yeah. Or am I being a hypochondriac? And then sometimes I go the opposite end of the spectrum where my dad was, where I like ignore everything Mm -hmm. because I, you know, don't want to yeah, deal be with that it. way yeah. yeah um so like but like my body doesn't care and I don't know which um how many factors are related to like my current depression and trauma and stuff um and how much of it were you know things that happened in my childhood whether it was just 
trauma on my body um, or the neglect that set this up. But as a kid, you were dealing with things and were not diagnosed just because of lack of... I was diagnosed with things. Okay. But that's because my mom was telling them what my history was and what the context at home was to prove to them that I met the diagnostic criteria of these things that are really fuzzy. Mm -hmm. There's really not a lot of disease. Like, the more science goes on, the more we know that we don't know. Yeah. Like, was there any thing specific that she basically told the doctors that they ended up diagnosing you with that you didn't have? Absolutely. Like what? The one that comes to mind first is tonsillectomy. I said, my throat really hurts after I cry because I threw temper tantrums a lot. And that's normal. Mm -hmm. Mom said, my throat gets infected this many times. She gave the information that led them to believe it was necessary to take out tonsils. So you got that surgery? I got that surgery. Um, and it wasn't until I had talked to a friend's mom and, you know, told her I was going to have the surgery and I get a little weirdly cheery about medical stuff. Definitely back then I did Mm -hmm. because I was proud of it because that's what I was exposed to. So I told her about it and she asked why. And I said, it's because my throat hurts after I cry. And she's like, that's normal for everyone. And then she gave me this look and I'm like, are things not normal? Mm -hmm. and then I moved on yeah we danced to Shania Twain at that sleepover yeah was Was there any other surgeries that she had you get I had ear tubes oh that's a funny story so ear tubes are pretty common for kids Mm -hmm. it's this like when they're growing um the ears sometimes are like not opening up with Mm -hmm. the in line with the rest of the growth or something and they put in these things that fall out as you grow older to like, it's kind of like you, when you get a spacer okay. in puberty because your face is growing. Um, and the reason that I had that surgery done was because I got my first ever mark wrong on a test in school because I was perfect student and if there was one question I got wrong it was an excuse for my mom to go full Karen and the question that I got wrong I remember this so clearly I had just started at a new new school and it was like the first day it was like first or second grade we were doing a spelling test and back then the teacher would have to read out the things and then we would write them down because that's how spelling tests work and one of the questions one of the words to spell was red in my mind because my family is very literary i was thinking it was the past tense of read it was actually the color red got it and that was enough for my mom to claim that i had hearing loss and needed a surgery and you actually got the surgery i got the surgery yeah wow. um and there were so many things i was told that I had, I was. Um, if you remember at all, the early '90s, there was this hype about um, red dye forty and kids consuming it mm-hmm. and like the problems that would ensue. And my mom fixated on that and decided that the rashes that I would get on my forearms were because of red candy and red jello. So I didn't have any of that again until I was an adult. I still get the rashes when I pet short-haired dogs because of the oils. Mm -hmm. And my mom was an animal hoarder. There were always animals going in and out of the house and way too many and not taken care of properly. And we had some. That's where I was getting the rashes from. Interesting. She just wanted to give me Benadryl, give me drugs, and make me part of the big deal. Now, would she let you... Obviously, she let you go to school, right? Like, did she let you have any friends and stuff like that? Oh, I was a social butterfly okay. and my friendships are why I'm alive. I'm really lucky that I did inherit my mom's charisma. She used it for evil, but I used it for survival. Mm-hmm. I've always had like, you know, found family. And there have been people in my community who they wouldn't tell me how weird my 
my upbringing was, but I'd be invited for meals quite a lot. Um, I'd be given rides to school, all of these things. But I always had a really active social life of peers. My mom was able to convince these doctors to do things that didn't need to be do done be between her very charismatic manipulation, her high intelligence, and ability to like, for better or worse, I grew up in the internet age and we always had the had a computer with internet so she could find things out and like twist things around. Um, there were seeds of real stuff going on. I have EDS. I was dislocating things a lot. Didn't realize until much later that, that was actually happening. I thought I was just like, I should have been able to walk it off, you know, like a twisted ankle. I didn't, I thought that I didn't need the, you know, braces that I need. Um, and a lot of it is just like the art to diagnosis because being like involved in all this healthcare stuff with myself, I mean, on the one hand, I am over the moon anytime like I have a complaint and there's like evidence of it because I'm like, I'm not crazy, mm -hmm. but I do have to go around saying, okay, this is actually impacting my function. Or I'll be like, I don't know if this is a valid complaint or if I'm overblowing it or if my depression or whatever is generating it. Mm -hmm. Like I've had headaches all of my life. And I've always been like, yeah, it's like dehydration, um, tension headaches, not having the right glasses prescription, you know, all these mm -hmm. little reasons. And then... Last week, I went to the neurologist's office because, like, my neck has been hurting so much. I've been having headaches several times a week. And I'm, I asked my PCP, should I see the doctor, the specialist about it? She said yes. I went to the neurologist. And he, you know, asked me the questions, how often do you have headaches and all this stuff. Last time I'd been to see him was for my sleep problems and memory problems. And he was like, it's, it's you need to see a sleep doctor. We know sleep is the problem. It's probably also causing problems with your memory. All of these little bits that you're describing, it's stress and sleep. I can't do anything for you. This time I expected the same thing. But I started telling him, you know, I have headaches. I think they're from tension and stress. I think maybe my EDS is making my neck too lax and like that gives me headaches. And he's like, whatever it is, you have a headache disorder and there's medication for it. I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. This is a valid complaint. Right. I never know whether I am becoming my mom and I really seek validation. So I know you were young because you said she passed away when you were 10. Looking back, even though you were so young, did you ever feel like there were times that you were in fear for your life? Um, mostly I was in fear for my mom's life because she had Munchausen's. Um, and that was a lot more scary. And the further she went with it and the further she went with her substance abuse, um, and one of the reasons why I did not suffer even in my first 10 years as much as my eldest brother did was that she was checking out from the world around her. So it was heavy with her mental and cognitive absence and that has an effect on children too like you know, oh yeah you know just seeing that yeah you're witnessing it you're like a lot of it has to do with like the long-term effects are that the kid never has their emotional needs met because they always have to put them aside in order to make things easier for the parent mm -hmm. and there's a lot of this insecurity like if my mom dies, where am I going to go? Right. Because it's like you have that dependence mm -hmm. built up. And you're like, you know, my brother picked on me today and I want comfort, but mommy's in a K-hole mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or something like that. I mean, she usually went for narcotics. Um, and it's just, I, I've always sort of, I've, I've been d digging deep in therapy and sort of, recently realizing how much just like 
bare bones insecurity and feelings of unsafety, but not necessarily life threatening, just like uneasiness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that applies to any child of a sick parent, regardless of why the parent is in that state. If it's a, like a, a parent with cancer, a parent with uh, MS and they're wheelchair bound and you know can't do things, and it's not the fault of the parent, but it still comes to like the kid, children, you know, going the psychoanalytic route, see their parents as kind of like gods. Like that's their everything. All of their life is dictated by those people. And when those people are not as all powerful as maybe your friend's parents are, um, or like they have their they have needs that go above your own, you know, it might not be right, but sometimes even a child's needs have to take a back burner and it's really sad and it really hurts the kid mm -hmm. so even if my mom had been right about her own stuff it would have had the same feeling of insecurity and fear right for me it wasn't though mm -hmm. um she had convinced a doctor oh a hallmark of munchausen's and by proxy doctor shopping and the problem with all of this is that people who have that, excuse you, I know, mm -hmm. uh, who have valid conditions that don't get heard because, oh my God, doctors are humans and some humans are real dicks um, and prejudiced and everything. And that's why women's health is what it is, especially like black women's health. I feel awful for everybody who like, goes around with a valid illness that gets ignored because they're a woman. When my mom doctor shopped, she was looking for somebody who would give her drugs, mm -hmm. who would believe her claims of having multiple sclerosis. That was like her disease of choice during my lifetime. She went through some others beforehand. A uh, big one was uterine cancer and breast cancer. We almost weren't born because she was going to get a hysterectomy. For no reason. And then she got pregnant with my oldest brother. And he claims that the reason we're alive is because he saved mom's uterus. Mm -hmm. um, so there's three of you, right? There's three. Okay. I'm the youngest of three and the only girl. So like the dynamic dynamics of the siblings, we had wildly different childhoods. Yeah. And I was going to ask if you are comfortable with it, like going through a timeline of kind mm -hmm. of your experience, I think would be really insightful. Oh, yeah. That would make a lot of this make more sense, too. Born 1992. I was made to have, as an infant, severe um, gastrointestinal reflux, and I couldn't drink breast milk. And there are a lot of possibilities for that. Don't know what sort of toxins were in there. Um, also, don't know what... My mom did quit smoking during each of her pregnancies. We know that. Um, and she didn't drink, but she was a huge fan of Demerol by the 90s. So uh, don't know what other things she may have had me in utero swimming in. Um, also, now I can't have any dairy. Like, it's not lactose intolerance. It's just I can't have it. So I don't know why I couldn't eat. Um, I had to get this like really special formula and it was like a whole deal. And when I got older, the way my mom explained it was probably overdone. But my oldest brother has this like seminal memory of doing homework at the kitchen table. He's probably 11. And little toddler me walked into the doorway and I looked directly at him. He looked directly at me. And then I opened my mouth and projectile vomited across the entire room. <laughs> So that was something that was happening. Um, and I, it took a long time for me to put on weight. Um, I also had asthma. My brothers remember me having asthma attacks. Did I really have asthma though? Or did I just have a little bit of a delicate system and two parents who chain smoked indoors? I did get a lot of ear infections. 
I think that was an environmental thing. But mm-hmm. also kids just get a lot of ear infections. Right. I just remember being like leaky as a kid. And I feel like all kids are leaky mm-hmm. of something or other. They're gross. Back in 1996, I was four-ish. Um, summertime. I think my parents had just had an argument because my mom stomped out of the house saying she was going to change the car battery. It's an old beat up car, probably did need a change of battery. That was not the sort of thing she would do. But she went to do that that day. And a few minutes passed, I don't know how long. And she came back into the house in a whole hullabaloo. And she had melted the skin off her hand presumably because the car battery was extremely hot you know how it is in maryland in the summer um so that would be valid if it hadn't been the back of her hand that melted off how does that happen like the entire back of her palm and a couple of knuckles pretty sure she did that to herself so kind of going back like when you said that you were in fear of your mom's life basically like was it because of scenarios like that like of things just happening where you would see her getting hurt i don't think the fear of her life came until later Later? when like it it was a an uh a cognitive thing that i could perceive okay but i mean like do you think like the build-up of like situations like that oh yeah okay yeah yeah the signs were there well before i was born yeah um and my could really like pick up on it yeah my brothers were picking up on it, so. Yeah. And thanks to our dad, we are, like, terminally honest, for better or worse. Mm-hmm. I, we're just not capable of, you know, glossing over these things or making them up, really. Um, so when they say stuff or when my dad says stuff, I believe it because they don't have it in them to say otherwise. And also, they don't really have a filter, which is helpful when you're asking about this stuff. But, like, this was, like, the shit that I did see even in my short amount of time with her was so fucking weird. Um, And I was so young at this point that I was also going with her to her appointments where she got skin grafted from her thigh to her hand. And so I'm real desensitized to a lot of the medical ickiness. Not all of it. I'll tell a story in a bit. But that was, like, a seminal memory. Yeah. Fucking weird. Also, like, climbing up hills of laundry that weren't clean. Just, like, spilling out into the hallway and stuff because that's how we lived. It's fucked up. I also remember, um, you know, you know how little kids are like, I can't go to sleep and, like, they knock on my parents' door and bother them at night. My mom would feed me Benadryl. And this is something I feel very strongly about. It, it's bonkers to me that you can buy children's melatonin, children's z just off the counter. I feel like even though it's not a dangerous medication, that you should have to have doctor approval to use things like yeah. that. Because I know to this day, and it's pretty normalized for parents to use these drowsiness medications to control their kid or to not bother with them. And that's what my mom did a lot. She gave us narcotics, the ones that she was taking. Like throughout the day? Um, Just here and there, okay. you know, depending on the day. Um, And it was usually for control or just to not have to deal with us because she was dealing with her own stuff. And it's so fucked up. And I hate that other people do it. I also know that there are a lot of parents who do this sort of like gaslighting Munchausen thing where like they convince doctors that their kids need Adderall or whatever um, because they don't want to deal with a kid that is, a you know, hyper, hyper yeah. or just like think differently than mm-hmm. they do or whatever. They're not adapting to their kid. Yeah. They're medicating their kids so that the kid can adapt to them or at least just not bother them and it drives me insane but there's also like valid reasons like some kids do need it um i have a nephew who does great on it and he feels happy to take it because all the like like buzzing in his brain he can 
get it into like a coherent state. Yeah. So, you know, it's so, it's so gray. Everything's right. so gray. I had a concussion in kindergarten. I think it was the only actual concussion that I had, but I will say I was taken to the hospital for quite a few of them because, you know, kids bonk their heads. Not all of them are a concussion. But for this story, it's a fun story, I think. Um, we had just gone on this new, like, blacktop installed for the playground for, like, the bigger kids to play basketball and stuff. But, like, kindergartners were strictly grass. That's all we could play on. But I was running, and the sun was shining in my face, so I couldn't really see where I was running. And I ran onto the blacktop. And, like, the second I realized where I was, I think it was a football. Could have been a basketball. Hit me straight up there. And I was all of, like, 30 pounds. So I went down hard, and I bonked my head there. And I think that's where I went unconscious. But I know, <laughs> because there was a print left over, um, that somebody stepped on my face while I was down. A big old boot print for, I guess, the rest of the day. Like, my brother saw it when I was taken to the hospital. But the next thing that I remember was waking up into the hospital and eating the best butter toast in my life. That was so good. And, like, all the attention I was getting. I really did pick up from my mom the sort of, like, enjoyment of medical attention. And, I mean, not it's not just learned. It's that she would give me attention instead of focusing on her stuff. Um, most of it was learned though, but so I think that was the only actual concussion that I had, but I know I went to the hospital and was treated for mm -hmm. other concussions, like minor bonks on the head. Like it's not, so you think like mainly with your mom, it was like medical abuse. Would you say for me, I did not get the emotional or physical abuse I definitely got psychological abuse because when it came to like the divorce of my parents my mom brainwashed me to hate my dad and testify bad things against him she convinced me that he was so evil that after she died I was terrified to live with him and why do you think that she did that just to keep you with her uh, because she had borderline personality disorder. Okay. And if you, um, like, read what it is, it's this, like, people with that either adore you and need you constantly or you do the slightest thing that you don't even know why they take offense to it and they hate you. Or if you leave them, they threaten to kill themselves. It's a very extreme reaction. And I think for my mom, the attention that she got from my dad stopped being being enough. So he became the villain. And I was a tool for that. Um, and there was also like putting me into a position where I had way too much control over the medical stuff in the household, where she had <sighs> convinced me of this, that, and the other that was wrong, pitted me against my brothers mainly my middle brother, because for some reason she really hated him. Um, and so, like, one really fucked up thing that she did, and I don't even know where to put this in the definitions of abuse. Um, she taught me to give her injections of something in her thigh. How old and were you? at best six or seven um so i remember i would take this little glass vial i would take a fresh needle hypodermic needle i'd put it through the little rubber seal i'd pull the syringe for whatever dose she told me to um making sure that the needle was submerged enough to actually get the liquid i would take it out i would you know, squeeze it a little bit to get the air bubbles out and do the shaking and everything. And then I guess this was supposed to be like a subdermal type of injection. Um, so she had taught me like how to pinch the skin of her thigh 
avoiding the graft scar, of course, uh, so that I was raised and give the injection there and like how slowly to squeeze it and everything, how to, uh, you know, blot it with the cotton ball to stop it. And it's like, first of all, why was I doing that? Second of all, she told me I was giving her saline. I knew what saline was, so I knew it was nothing serious. It wasn't until way later in my life that at first of all, I realized that I had done that. It was a repressed memory that like hit me in the middle of like walking my dog or something. Um, it's just like, hmm, okay, I have that to work out now. Um, it was such a clear memory. And then I went to college, my best friend and roommate, uh, is a nurse and I told her about this and she's like, why would she need an injection of saline in her soft tissue? Like, what is, like, that, that doesn't do anything. It's just, it's sore. And I'm like, oh, you have a point there. And then it occurred to me fairly recently, saline doesn't come in little glass vials. What the hell was I giving my mom? Why was she involving me in this at all? And when um, she eventually finally got a good safe and started putting her uh, narcotics in there, she was mostly bed bound. So I was you know, helping her get her medications. And with stuff that had happened with my brothers, I was the only one other than her who had, who knew the combination at nine. What the fuck? So it's just like, I don't know where to categorize that kind of um, abuse. Mm -hmm. um, I know that she hit my brothers. I know that she verbally abused them. She... Uh, psychologically manipulated them horribly. She made them feel awful about themselves and dependent on her. And it was really bad, but I can't really speak to it. Did you feel dependent on her, would you say? I mean, I was so young. Of course mm -hmm. I was. Like like when she passed away, how did that hit oh, you? Oh, we'll get into that story. Okay. That, that's a, a good one. I want to get back into this. Go ahead. Oh, also, um, I had a... I don't know why I had so much dental work done, but I did as a, uh, like, small child before I had any adult teeth, so it was kind of pointless. That was, like, early, early days just coming online when we lived in Maryland the first time. Um, I moved a lot. So we get to the first shitstorm in my life. There were others before. Um, when I was in kindergarten, my dad lost his job. He had been manager of a fancy men's shoe store. And, you know, the need for that really <laughs> tanked. Um, they just went to Macy's. Things got real tense between my parents for a long time um, while he was unemployed. But he finally got a new job working for the U.S. government. And he sort of had uh, an option of which state he wanted to work in. And my mom said that we should go to New Jersey. And we lived in an apartment that was in, you know, a project building. Um, but we only ended up living there for 11 months. And 11 months is not a long time, but a lot of shit happened. So my dad started working for the U.S. Department of Immigration, helping... Uh, people who have lived in the U.S. for a long time get their citizenship. You know, they've met that time criteria. Um, and he was one of the good guys. He always wanted to help. Uh, and that's when I got my ear tubes implanted, my first surgery. Um, that's the year my oldest brother spent Hanukkah in the hospital. But I think what really like escalated the situation that year, my dad got news from his doctor that he would require the exact same open heart procedure that his father got at the same age, but 
died during. So dad wasn't well. And the dynamic in the household wasn't good. Obviously, he survived. But that kicked in, like, my other end of the spectrum when it comes to health of like he wasn't taking good enough care of himself you know he let his heart fall apart and he later on developed diabetes he was still smoking for seven years after open heart surgery oh my god and when he got back from the hospital i like my five-year-old self was like oh you're supposed to eat low low saturated fat i can read that because I was precocious. And so I ended up like trying to make him his food for him. A lot of it ended up being like jelly and ketchup sandwiches, but I was trying. And I was seriously like my adolescence with him, I I'm the one who made sure nutritional needs were met. I didn't know enough, but I'm the one who did it. He's been awful at taking care of himself and that time was really what kicked me off of like why aren't you taking care of yourself? Whereas my mom was, you're doing too much. And my mom, for some reason, was a stay-at-home mom. She shouldn't have been. But she was spending a lot of time on the computer. And this is like Windows 98. She spent a lot of time on Yahoo Games talking to people. And she met a guy on the internet. And I guess... That was closer to meeting her emotional needs than what she was getting from dad at the time while he was dealing with his stuff. And my brother was out of the hospital. So she got it into her head that she was going to take the family, leave her abusive husband. I don't know how they were both abusive to the kids and they both yelled at each other. So, um, and go have her happy ending with this man she met on the internet in 1990. So one day I got home from school and things in the household were weird. A lot of mo movement was happening. My mom told me to pack up whatever I can fit in our little Honda Civic alongside her, both of my teenage brothers, our cat, a dog, my own body. We drove away that day. My dad didn't realize that this was kidnapping over state lines. <laughs> so she, he kind of just let us go. And we just drove south. My mom had stolen his financial information and manipulated my siblings into helping her with that. And we would stay at hotels and timeshares of, fam of family members and friends' houses that she'd had in the past and internet friends' houses. So great parenting there. But it turned out that this man on the internet did not want my bonkers mom and her three children lo and behold so we were effectively homeless for a while that and we didn't have to be um when i did sleep in the car it was while mom was chugging energy drinks and driving um we usually had a, a, a roof to sleep under um one way or the other usually by theft um <laughs> So we eventually settled down in Northern Virginia, the first place in Northern Virginia. Um, and we lived there for, I want to say like a year and a half. I was... Did you have contact at all with your dad at this time or you... Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, during the homeless bit, I don't remember, mm -hmm. but I remember like when we settled down into this apartment, he came down for visits okay. and they were working out the divorce. So like there had to be communication. Mom occasionally would have a job for like a week or less and then not. This is where I really like became aware of her decline because she would start spending many days in a row in her bed. I remember myself being asked to go get her Oxycontin. And like I would read the labels on the, the bottle. I would bring the pill to her. She wouldn't be able to even like do anything so I'd open the bottle I'd give her whatever pills that she asked for and I'd hand her her water um there were times during this that she was still like had days where she was a person um but they were she was often out of the picture as well she would just be 
doing her own thing. And it was just very weird. Um, we had this term that we used called episodes. And what I was told is that they're, they were MS episodes. I don't know what the fuck that's supposed to mean anymore. But um, a lot of times they seemed like, you know, she was high on narcotics. You know, she had moved from Demerol to Oxycontin. Um, and if you picture somebody who's high on Oxycontin, it's pretty much like that. Like, you can talk to them and there's, they're obviously alive, but they're not there. They're mm-hmm. not getting out of bed. Um, they're checked out. It's like, that's not my mom. That's, she's gone. Um, she'll come back. But a lot of them were like her acting like an entirely different person, like with energy. And it's all, it was almost like, having a dissociative identity alter but i know it wasn't because she never gave any information no like identifying of who she'd been um she wouldn't lose track of time you know stuff like that it wouldn't last more than like a day and it didn't happen while she was out in the world it happened from bed um but It scared the crap out of me. It was the most terrifying experience and it happened again and again. And from here on with increasing frequency, she'd ask for like peanut butter sandwiches. She hated peanut butter. She would talk in a little baby voice and be like, I don't know where I am. Where am I? And it's like, that's my mom. (sighs) For... I don't, I don't know how to communicate, like, and I, I've definitely repressed a lot of the details, but I remember that feeling of being like, something's wrong with my mom, she's not here, and I, 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 I'm scared, and I need my mom to make me feel better, but she's scared, I'm taking care of her, and I don't know what it was. I don't know if she was doing it on purpose. I don't know if it had any dissociative aspects, if it was regression. I mean, obviously that factored into part of it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. She could have been faking. She had been consciously faking. I don't know. But it was for a long time, like the worst trauma that really stuck and was repeated. Um... The, during this time, the divorce proceeded, but my mom had manipulated the situation. She got, you know, me and probably my siblings uh, turned against him. And she'd also, like, m- manipulated the system and miscommunicated things so that my dad wouldn't be, you know, showing up to the hearings when he was supposed to. And basically, she got full custody and he got visitation rights with, like, um, what is it called? like chaperoning, Mm -hmm. which he didn't deserve. So we also got evicted from that one because my mom wasn't working. And the house was disgusting, and we were probably neighbors from hell. Um, Because my oldest brother was still pseudo-disabled, we'd had social workers involved. I don't – we had so many professionals involved in my upbringing – and some of them knew what was going on, but just it was such a weird situation. And my mom was so manipulative and the social working field is so overworked. And like those people were present and yet things still never happened. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the Gypsy Rose case, there were social workers involved who thought she was uh, mentally disabled and everything who believed it because they could see it and when she wasn't being given drugs and she stood up and she talked they were amazed yeah because that's the things that happen but anyway um this social worker happened to have a dad who wasn't in his house for this time i don't know why but we were able to stay at this house while my mom uh arranged for us to move into a new place so even though we were in a house i still consider us homeless Mm -hmm. we were in a weird spot but um we got section 8 housing which is through a welfare program we just moved to a different 
part of Virginia and I started at another school and we lived here the longest. Um, so this is the place where most of the really bad stuff happened. Um, I have this really bad trigger involved with tobacco and smoking and stuff. I, it makes me infuriated and I get panic attacks and things. And that's because, first of all, both my parents were smokers and gross. Um, but my mom was increasingly bedridden. And she'd be using the child support payments for just not, nothing to do with the kids. Uh, a lot of the times it was for cartons of cigarettes. It was those big ones. And the marble, mar, Marlboro worst brand name ever uh packs with the red triangle so like, those are seared into my mind um and she just smoked them and she'd be high and like dropping them and she'd have like her nightgowns and her skin would be pockmarked with cigarette burns um and a lot of them fell off the couch and there was an ashtray not the couch the bed there was an ashtray but she often knocked it over in her stupor so, like, the side of her bed that she was closest to, it went from, like, a medium pile beige carpet to basically, like, a black vinyl sort of texture, compacted with dirt and a lot of cigarette ash. And when she didn't have money for more cigarettes or couldn't convince my eldest sibling to buy them for her, um... <laughs> She wouldn't do anything herself. She'd have me do this. I would go down on my hands and knees um, and crawl next to and under the bed, picking up all of the dropped cigarette butts with like little tiny amounts left. And I'd collect them for her. I'd be like, you know, hands and knees getting covered in not just the impacted ash, compacted ashes, but also like, with the way we had animals, like a lot of shit and piss and her bodily fluids and inevitably and uh, bits of medication and garbage and everything. And I'd be like collecting them into her ashtray so, so she could smoke these little bits off. This, that was another repressed memory that came up. Um, and in the, that same spot, on this one occasion, she had a friend over, a female friend, which we never had friends there, especially not adults. It was a very weird off day. I don't know what the dynamic there was, but she was during one of her bedridden phases. I don't know what this person was doing, honestly, but they were going to watch Rocky Horror Picture Show in that bed, which I shared with my mom. I didn't sleep in my own bed. I had one. I didn't use it because things were weird anyway they were gonna watch rocky horror picture show and i felt like i was being pushed out i was so unhappy i didn't have my bed i didn't have my mom um so i may have cock blocked them i don't know but i can i my mom said you can you know make a little bed for yourself over here and watch it never mind that i actually couldn't like see the tv much because of uh, the poster of the bed or the fact that I was eight years old watching Rocky Horror Picture Show, which I love now, but it has themes of nudity, murder, abuse, cannibalism, incest, transphobia, hateful language, and more. And a lot of tatas. Um, so that was the first time I watched that. But I was setting up my little bed there and I'd put pillows down and then I needed to reach something on the table that was going to be behind me. So I, I like scooted forward on my knees onto my pillows, but then I stopped and I didn't know why. So I backed up and there was this little black line sticking out of the pillow and I started to feel a sharp pain in my knee. I looked at my knee. It had about, you know, a centimeter long, uh, cut. It was bleeding, not like gushing, but pretty heavy bleed. Um, and I picked up my pillow and I didn't realize that I'd put it 
on a pile of used needles. And usually for even a minor injury like this, my mom would have taken me to the hospital for stitches. And honestly, it probably should have had stitches. Um, and definitely like a tetanus shot and screening to make sure I didn't get like hepatitis or something. Um, but obviously I would be taken away if anybody said what had happened. So we did not go. And I don't know really what happened the rest of that day. I know that I did clear things out and make my bed and watch Rocky Horror until I fell asleep. And then she moved on to fentanyl. You know, that big hot topic in the opioid crisis. That was her drug of choice at the end. And she got them in lollipop form. It's called Actique and it's meant for terminally ill children. And she got huge boxes of them because she had found a doctor that was later sued for malpractice well after she died, but um, gave them to her. Mm, you didn't care. And I know that my sibling, one of my siblings did get hooked on them and stole them a lot, which is why we later got that safe. Mm-hmm. Um, and my mom continued to villainize him. Uh, and also I know what those lollipops taste like which is not good. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, she was basically out of her head most of the time at this point. I don't think she left her bed a lot of the time. I mean, certainly at no point in my childhood were my parents doing laundry, cooking meals, making sure that I got bathed, um, making sure that I made it to school on time. A lot of that was handled by my siblings and by neighbors. If... It was done at all. It took me a long time to start bathing regularly. I didn't even start washing my face regularly until I was 16. I didn't know. Yeah. Um, And when I moved in with my dad, he didn't know that I didn't know. He didn't think that things were like that. Um, There's this one really fucked up story where um, we all the kids had been gifted cats for some reason. And my brother's cat had they were outdoor cats indoor outdoor and this one had tried to crawl underneath the fence between us and the neighbor and the neighbor kid came and got me we had played it sometimes and uh said you know come out here and see this and I saw it and it was bad and I ran into my mom who told me to put the cat into a box and bring it over um and I did that and I also wrapped up um his butt in some sort of cloth because he'd lost control of his bowels he had broken his spine trying to crawl under and so my mom and I waited for a while until that brother was available and my mom convinced him that her plan was okay and that this cat had no life ahead of it And she used her medical supplies, possibly medication as well, um, but definitely needles, to euthanize it at home with us watching. And this was her least favorite sibling uh, of my siblings, so it definitely felt personal. I had a cold and I learned from my mom that you spend a full week in bed regardless of what it is anytime you're sick Mm -hmm. so this one time I was doing that and I was kind of high on cold medication which is probably more than I needed Um, my mom was in the other room uh, chatting online with strangers and I had gone and asked her uh, for something to cut yarn with because I was doing a craft in bed. She told me to go get scissors. I couldn't find scissors. I didn't feel like going back, so I grabbed a steak knife. And I used that to cut the yarn on my crafts in bed. And the next morning, I got real zoomy from cold medicine and being eight or nine years old. But I also knew not to leave bed. So I was rolling around on it, just like being a crazy kid. And then for some reason, I stopped. I didn't know why, but my body couldn't move. 
And then my brother, who had been in the house and who had been hearing me just be a crazy kid, he noticed that I'd gone silent and that was weird. So he walked in and he saw what had happened and he made this weird, the weirdest sound I've ever heard from a person who wasn't trying to make weird sounds. It was just like, ah, ah, from this giant six foot two, 300 pound mountain man. And that alerted my mom <laughs> that something was up. Uh, so she came in and assessed the situation. And what had happened was I left the steak knife in bed. And in all of my rolling, I'm so lucky it didn't hit like my kidney or something. But in my rolling around, it had gone through my arm in and out and then through the comforter. Ugh. So it's like I couldn't move because if I did, the comforter was such a weight I'd probably like get half my arm cut off mm -hmm. and usually my mom loved calling 911 for anything but she saw this situation knew she'd be in trouble as a parent and instead acted really fast and knew that even though you're not supposed to do this she was like okay we can't take you to the hospital without removing the comforter so she ripped it out of my arm, had my brother wrap it super tight with a towel, loaded us three in the car, sped off to the hospital. It was sometime while I was in the car that the pain and fear registered, and I started screaming. Back then, I was great at screaming. They, When we got to the ER waiting room, I had to be put into a private room because I was scaring other people. And so, yeah, I got stitched up. I didn't get it signed this time because it hurt, and I learned that that was kind of lame. Um, but I got the stitches removed a little too early, and I could see straight through my arm, which is pretty cool. And I was desensitized to gore. Mm -hmm. My dad insists that this was an instance of my mom being a shitty parent. And, yeah, how she 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 should have had 911 come and do that. But... He feels like the whole thing was her fault. And it's like, no, I'd asked for scissors. She told me where to get them. I didn't do it. And then I left the knife in bed. I was old enough to know not to leave a knife in your bed. I wasn't that stupid. It was my fault. Um, but he disagrees. September 9th, 2002. I was once again sharing bed with my mom. It was the middle of the night. My oldest sibling who was 19 at the time, came into the room and woke me up and told me to be quiet. And I thought it was really funny. I had gone to um, the fair a couple days before and I had these gigantic glow-in-the-dark glasses. So I put them on so I could see him better because it was dark. He didn't appreciate that. Um, but he, he told me, I want to make sure that, you know, before it happened, before mom hears about it, that I am leaving tonight. I'm moving out. I'm moving to Illinois with this person because I, I it's not good for me here with mom. And um, I can't tell her about it or she'll make things very bad. And I want to take you with me. Um, you deserve a life outside of here. And I just can't because that's going to be kidnapping over state lines. And mom is going to have me put in jail and you'll be right back here. But I want you to know that I love you and that I need to do this. And that I'm, I'm sorry, I can't take you. And that was the most important thing anybody had said to me in my entire childhood. Because it told me, yes, things are weird. Yes, this is bad for us. Mom is the enemy. And there's a reason why people who care about you can't get you out of here but I still love you. It was so like honest and upfront and adult and mature because there have been 
so many adults who like knew what was going on and I didn't realize until later that they knew or that they wanted to help or that they couldn't help. Mm -hmm. And this was so honest. And really the only thing that bummed me about it was that my birthday was like two weeks later and he'd be missing that. And that birthday was sadly uneventful even though I was entering the double digits. That was my 10th birthday. But also, um, him being like the target and my main parent, honestly, and, you know, a shield for me. When he left, mom turned all of her attention on me and herself, mostly herself. My other brother was high on narcotics or doing whatever teenagers do. Um... So somehow she had rented out this other brother that left his room to a random guy. Eh, whatever. I'm going to call him guy because he is pretty important in this. Um, about a month after my brother left is when I developed the skin picking. Um, and then for Thanksgiving that year, my brother, not my brother, he was off doing something. My dad had come down to have Thanksgiving with us. And mom was having an episode. So it was really just my dad and me. I was really sad, especially because, like, I'd made a pie for the first time. I, I'd cooked for the first time. And my dad's diabetic, so I made it with a sugar alternative. And I did not know that sweet and low is, first of all, disgusting. And second of all, undergoes a change when baked with. And it was, it was poison, but he liked it. Um, but like, yeah, my mom was missing Thanksgiving, even though she was just in the other room. And my dad was pissed off at her for this. And he was exposing me way too much to that. But they kind of like, when she'd been coherent, kind of arguing, like, what the fuck is wrong with you? It's like, how dare you call me out for this? Don't you know? Blah, blah, blah. And at one point when my dad and I were at the table, we heard a fall and she had fallen. Um, and my dad was pissed off yelling at her, claiming that she was faking this and whatever. And I was so confused because I was looking at my mom who had fallen. She may have fallen on purpose, but there were bones sticking out. She had severely broken her ankle, and because of dad being a bitch about it, she wanted to spite him and didn't go to the hospital for it for a couple of days and had to spend, I think, a couple of weeks there in the hospital. And so I was basically home alone with an AWOL brother and guy and neighbors taking care of me well and guy would drive me to the hospital after school to talk to my mom and so weird but she did come home with the cast on at that point i don't remember when it happened but she'd had a um an iv implanted in her chest for administering whatever medication she was taking that day she may have had that um put in a while before I don't remember she really shouldn't have been sent home with that that should have been like a you know facility managed thing but they were gonna send nurses to take care of her um but they didn't because we lived in squalor and my mom was a difficult person to get along with and she chased each of them off and they were you know pissed that they couldn't even like wash their hands properly to do their job it was it basically had um just been very badly neglected um and then comes holiday time i don't remember what we did for hanukkah uh but my brother at home went to go spend a uh, winter break with brother not at home so it was just me guy and my mom my mom was mostly not present anyway in my gut and guy was off in his room so i was just sad and alone and it was a very depressing time um and then uh on new year's eve my family has this had i don't know this tradition of watching the ball drop and like spending all evening like eating um like those you know fr freeze and 
bake um, in the oven, you know, appetizers, you know, potato skins, mozzarella sticks, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, so I had like prepared those for myself, all sad like, and gone into the living room and had the TV on. But mom wasn't like, usually when she was high on drugs, I didn't know she was high on drugs. I thought this was all MS, but usually she'd get up occasionally, use the bathroom. I'd be able to have uh, short conversations with her, you know, she'd, she'd be a person. But this day she was like, not really waking up from whatever thing she was in. She'd have her eyes open and her body would move. And I'd keep having to go in there because her like nightgown, she didn't wear underwear, kept riding up. And it was like, that's not decent. And I put it back down. Um, and sometimes she made it difficult because she was like rolled over. But it was like really weird because usually when she was you know, seeking attention, she'd be seeking attention, you know, playing it up. Um, or she'd just be asleep with a burning cigarette in her mouth. And I went up to Guy and I'm like, this episode is really weird. Like, I've never seen it like this. And he's like, he'd been over it with my mom. So he kind of just dismissed it. And, you know, I, I'd go back and forth being alone in the living room, checking on my mom. And occasionally I'd be like, Guy, I... Like, this is really weird. Um, And her eyes were open the whole time, but, and she was breathing and everything, but like, she wasn't, her eyes weren't focusing. She wasn't saying anything except for like the occasional murmur. Totally non responsive. And I'd finally convinced him I know we have ambulances come all the time for no reason, but can you please call one? Like, this is weird. It was like 1030 or something, uh, an hour and a half until the new year started. And it was just weird. And like I said, we'd had them over all the time. And usually they'd be like talking amongst themselves and kind of ignoring mom because they were familiar with her bullshit. But this time was different. They were like serious. And... You know, they talked with Guy to arrange for me to come to the hospital behind them. And I didn't know what was going on, but they were, you know, loading her into the ambulance and we went there. I wasn't taken to see her immediately. We were really familiar, my family, with this hospital. And I was taken to a part that I'd never seen before. And I ended up talking to a social worker who was asking me a bunch of stuff. And arranging for my aunt to come down from New York to come get me that night. Because, you know, I wasn't going to go home in that situation without mom. Um, And when I was taken in to see mom, she was, I think, put into the ICU or a coma ward or something. But things were different. Things were very serious, very quiet, very somber. And usually mom would be attention-seeking. And at like 2 a.m. or something, my aunt had made the drive down and taken me to my other aunt's house who was doing business in Italy. And I didn't even know she lived so close. And um, another aunt arrived. I have three of them. So one's gone, the other two there. And I woke up the next day and they had made me breakfast. And it was really tasty. It was a nice house and everything was pretty. And I was kind of just vibing and I enjoying the attention from my family. Um... And gradually over time, like my dad came down from New Jersey and unfortunately we had to return to our house. And, you know, my brothers returned and we, as a unit, all of us would go to the hospital each day and see my mom in the ICU, I think it was, and she had been cleaned up but underneath she looked uh, not great you know and what I was really fixated on was that for some reason they couldn't keep her eyes closed so they were bolted open the entire time and because of that they had to have like these gauze pads soaked in I think iodine or something taped to her face so that they wouldn't just like, um, and freak us out even more. But I, I, every time we went to look at her, I stared at that. 
She still had the IV port. She still had the cast on her leg, but that's what really freaked me out. And when we went into like the, the family hanging out room of the hospital, um, the adults would kind of gradually introduce me to the idea of my mom's brain dead and, you know, telling me that there's no chance this time. She, like, there is, she's dying. She's dead. It's just a matter of getting my brother, who is, you know, the power of attorney in this case, to sign off on her uh, machines being turned off. And then we're going to have a funeral. And then I'm going to move in with my dad. And all of these changes were happening. And I did not want to move in with my dad because I thought he was evil. Was it all the medication that basically led to this? <sighs> it was definitely a big factor. Okay. Um, the official, like, documented cause of death, the doctor wrote, was blood infection, which implied that the neglect to her chest IV had created an infection that entered her bloodstream mm -hmm. and brain, heart, everything. And that's what she died of. People in my family say that that was just the polite thing to say and that she'd overdosed that she'd committed suicide, whatever. Don't know. Um, but, you know, even if it was just the infection in her chest and she didn't mean for that to happen, um, she caused it to happen. Because it was Munchausen's. It, it, she wouldn't have had that if she wasn't making herself sick. Um, and... It was also the drugs. She wasn't cleaning it because she was too high to give a shit. Like, it, it's complicated. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I got so angry for such a long time that it happened specifically when I was alone with her. Like, why couldn't it have waited for my other brother to come back from his visit? Or why couldn't it have happened before he left? Why couldn't have there been somebody more mature around that I could trust? Why did it have to be me alone? I think what it was, was that she wasn't getting enough attention with just me. Um, and, you know, people actually can't control things like that unless they can. Um, but I'd been told around that time that, you know, the reason that she went into a coma as opposed to straight up died was that she was holding on long enough for all of her family to get there. And it's like, if she has control over that, why do it when I'm alone? And like, does she not love me enough? All those things. And I've mostly worked through that. But um, yeah, so she died. She wanted to be cremated. So that happened, but we're Jewish. So it was kind of dicey trying to get the rabbi to agree to have a funeral with a thing of ashes in there because it's mm -hmm. not a thing that you're supposed to do um and i hated the funeral because my dad was like weeping and like strangling my hand the whole time and i was annoyed at him i didn't feel close to him yeah. i wanted to grieve on my own but like i <sighs> apparently her parents my mom my grandparents were there um, but my aunts had made sure that they didn't say shit to us, that they didn't say shit to anybody because in a lot of ways they made this happen. Like the abuse that my mom had endured led to this. The relationship that they had led to a lot of this. And they were not very nice people and they would have made things worse. And then even though I like you know, fought against it as hard as I could, I still had to move in with my dad who had <sighs> during his you know, single times and recovering from my mom's financial ruin of him had been living in New Jersey in the studio apartment in a really bad place and didn't have the time to 
pick up and change everything for his two kids now moving in with him. So that's where we lived. Studio apartment. Fully infested with cockroaches. Um, he slept on the bed, the proper bed, because that's that was his bed. My brother slept on a bare mattress in the kitchen area. And I slept on a recliner that had been crawling with roaches. I could hear them. They bit me. And I spent every night after my dad fall, fell asleep crying for that first year every night. And some of it was, you know, I missed my mom. And some of it was that I was here now. And a lot of it was that I felt deprived of any sort of mothering. I missed the idea of my mom. And I felt really bad for myself and trauma happened. Um, And after a year living in this apartment, it like the infestations got so much worse because we were so crowded in i still had a dog with me and he was shitting everywhere because nobody taught me otherwise really um there was no sense of responsibility in my childhood ever um and you know we had all this stuff crammed in everywhere and things were just bad and so we had like when I was getting ready in the mornings for school, I had to wear shoes the whole time and because there would be maggots crunching under my feet. Um, and we got a few mice come through. Uh, and the cockroach problem got so bad that they would crawl out of my backpack at school. And usually I could stomp on them before anybody else noticed, but it happened a couple of times where my classmates noticed and screamed and made a whole hullabaloo and my teachers would notice and have me from then on store my backpack in the boiler room every morning so that I didn't get cockroaches everywhere. And I think that's probably what led to child services getting involved. They'd been involved in our entire lives, but with mom, nothing ever happened. With dad and with that situation and with it happening at school, We were kicked out of that apartment, and that day I came home. I was barred from coming in. My dad came home from work early. He found out what was going on, and he sobbed and, like, hugged me, and I was pretty numb to it and still very annoyed with him. I mean, this was his fault, and also I didn't love him at that point, but he was just, like, putting all of this emotion on me when it was his fault. It's like... I'm going to go stay at my friend's house for the night. And then the next day, he got us a motel room for a couple weeks while he got us a new apartment. We lived in that apartment for a year. And then the landlord wanted it for something else. So we went to another apartment for a year. And by that point, my brother was in college. So it was just me and my dad. And oh my God, people underestimate the burden of being the youngest. You get your parents alone during your teenage years when it's the worst um but then my dad he'd been working for the department of immigration for a while he had the opportunity to move to a federal job um and asked me do i want to live on the maryland side which is where i was born lived for a while or the virginia side where i have more memories many of them bad And I chose the Maryland side. And by that point, I'd been in nine different schools by ninth grade. I had changed schools that many times. I had moved 16 times by age 14. The lack of stability, the developing your brain and having these other things to remember and learn like um how to navigate your school making new friends stuff like that it really fucked up my long-term memory oh i should say my memory for long term because i have trouble forming new ones but by the time we got down to maryland i didn't know it at the time but i would be in the same high school all four years 
we finally got furniture. Crappy furniture, but furniture. We still had cockroaches. My dog still shat everywhere. And then I went off to college and these cockroaches would occasionally crawl out of my suitcase when I, between semesters when I came back and that was humiliating. Um, and I didn't learn until I was living on my own, like not even at college, but got my first apartment. That's not hard to not have cockroaches. So well, that, there were so many failings, but I will say like, especially once we moved back to Maryland, each year things got mostly a little bit better. And the way see, uh, PTSD works is that the further you get away from danger, the more you can express that fear and all the emotions that you had to repress earlier for survival. So that's when PTSD gets bad. That's when I started having flashbacks and panic attacks and periods of catatonia. Um, and my dad was really bad at handling it. He knew, like... I was a 10-year-old whose mom had died unexpectedly. Obviously, I had trauma. He knew I had PTSD. He actually got me into therapy. Great job on him. He got me into therapy first time when I was 12. And again, when I was 14 um, and had, like, the first depressive episode that, like, a teacher noticed and um, brought to my attention. Like, he was good about that, but he had so little just emotional regulation that when I was distressed, he'd be, you know, confused. He'd take offense to my silence. He would be very reactive and impatient and, again, put his emotional needs first and his inability to regulate his emotions ahead of my obvious intense experiences that he knew about and respected. So we'd always have these blow-ups where he'd scream at me and I'd cry and scream back. And eventually I would stomp off to my bedroom as if this was any old normal teenage tantrum. And, you know, later in the day, I'd have to come out for a meal or something and he'd be apologetic. He would recognize what he did wrong and he would apologize. And then it'd be the same thing a week later. Now that I am living in a place where I am fully secure, I don't have to worry about food. I don't have to worry about people yelling at me or dying or any of that. All of those times where I've had to push my fear or my needs or anything aside have come up and are manifesting themselves now which is why like with my health problems now a lot of it is I don't know how much of that is reenactment or manifestation of the past I get my mom she had this emotional need that couldn't be met you know between her parents being the way they were and her emotional you know borderlines type stuff being the way they were she had such intense like intense emotional needs and didn't know how else to express it than what she'd been exposed to and what had been successful in the past which was medical attention and medical attention for the ones around her and that got you know enough emotional fulfillment that it outweighed the actual mortal danger to her body. So I really get it. Like, I wasn't taken care of as a kid. And, like, my tolerance for my pain, for the real things going on, as well as all the stuff that I don't feel sure about, is so low that little things seem bigger than they are. And a lot of it, big and small, feels like it It needs more attention and it's more consuming and I feel more helpless to it because I want to need to be taken care of. And so in a psychological 
dynamic type thing I I'm afraid of becoming like my mom but I definitely see those instances where I put others into positions where they have to be worried about me and it's because I want my emotions validated Mm -hmm. sometimes my emotions are just like my leg hurts like shit like I want to cut it off right now if you were experiencing this you'd be on the floor crying but this is my daily existence please validate me but other times it's just like I can't and a lot of that's depression you know theories of helplessness um and so hard trying to figure out how to get that to mean I can like re- just recognizing the emotions mm. isn't enough to change but it will take practice yeah and I think like you said too just sorting through everything that you experienced and went through it takes time mm-hmm. you know and it, it's a lot and that's a lot on a child to have to go through whether things were directly done to you by your mom or your dad or even just things that you witnessed Mm -hmm. that's stuff that you're going to hold on to for years and that you have to work through through years of therapy and just you know self-work and stuff like that so it's a lot oh yeah I've been in therapy more than half my life Mm -hmm. um and I go I do it every week and I see my psychiatrist every month and I try different medications and with Munchausen and Munchausen by proxy entering the mainstream I do feel like it's bringing a lot more out of the woodwork because right now like there's no anything for survivors we don't know what is the typical survivor experience like physically and emotionally yeah and everything's going to be different too Mm -hmm. but but we're getting to the point where you know the actions to learn about Mm -hmm. that are being taken yeah um because people are aware of it right um same things going on with complex ptsd which no doubt i have both ptsd and complex ptsd complex ptsd isn't in the dsm yet it will be i'm sure but it's just like we become aware of it and then everybody else becomes aware of it and more people become aware that they have it And we realize how important it is, so we dedicate more research to it. We develop modalities the same way Marsha Lenahan did. And so I have hope for the future. I also have hope that there's going to be medications developed in my time for my physical stuff. Um, But, you know, I I want to show that there is survivorship out there. Absolutely. And life after it and stuff that we got to figure out Mm -hmm. i also have been on the inside i've seen how these things happen and survivors aren't being asked it's all the psychologists and the doctors and people on boards of whatever being like piecing it together from outside and not understanding how these things pan out um yeah and that's why i think it's important too that you know you had this platform to share mm-hmm. your experience and your story and bring education into it as well um, and vulnerability. So thank you so much for that. And you did yeah. a great job, really. Thank you. I of do course. like to talk. Of course. No, you did great though, okay. really. Yeah.